Good morning. I have to tell you a weird, that's a weird moment. I, um, we went to spring break one year ago in Florida. It was a beach that looked exactly like the beach in that video. And the last day, so we went, we, we left and nothing was shut down yet. And the day we came home, everything was shut down. <clears throat> it kind of happened while we were gone, but I had a day that looked exactly like that woman's day minus the, the book. But the last day I was there, I just, we couldn't leave our beach and no one could come on our beach because it was private, but we were stuck there. So I just like her movements, everything about what she did was like, wow, that's crazy. That was my experience. I, and I laid down and I knew that I knew that my life was going to be different that day as we drove home and that nothing would be the same. So um, thank you, Roxanne. That's, that's just a really, um, that's a really vivid image for me personally. I, I know that obviously is unplanned, but um, that's crazy. Uh, our scripture today is from the book of Jeremiah. So I wanna tell you what I've learned about Jeremiah. And a lot of you have um, studied this uh, prof prophecy um, a lot more than I have, but um, here's, this is from my Bible, so I'm guessing this information is, you know, really pretty accurate. So the personal life and struggles of Jeremiah are kind of what this account represents. I'll just read to you a few things that are, uh, that I've underlined. The personal life and struggles known to us in depth and detail uh, more than any other Old Testament prophet are found here. So the name Jeremiah is suggested to mean the Lord exalts or even the Lord throws, either in the sense of hurling the prophet into his hostile world or throwing down the nations in divine judgment for their sins. So his ministry began in 626 BC and ended in 586 BC. That gives you a little perspective of where we are time-wise. How and where he died is not known. He was a priest. He was married and had children, which is interesting because he traveled around so much in relative isolation um, that that is kind of hard to imagine which part of his life he was married and had children. Um, he was primarily a prophet of doom. We know and um, that he wrote the book of Lamentations in addition to this book of Jeremiah. So he attracted only a few friends as would a prophet of doom um, have. His closest companion was his faithful secretary Baruch, who wrote down his words as he directed them. He wrote most of them on the long road to exile. And Baruch was also responsible for the final version of the book of Jeremiah. They feel like he um, actually penned that. So Jeremiah was prone to um, self-criticism, self-analysis, we do know a great deal about this, about his personality, timid in nature. On occasion, I like this part. On occasion, he engaged in calling for redress against his personal enemies. And the term, I've never heard this term, a Jeremiah um, refers to a, denunci a denunciatory tirade of complaint. I do that. I have Jeremiah's. So to use that in a sentence, um, Brian LeBeer had a Jeremiah during the basketball game yesterday. So that's how that works. That's using it in a sentence. So he is characterized by often having anguish in spirit and he is known as the weeping prophet. So let me see if I got every, all of my, he had a son he did, a, he, he had a lot of famous prophecies, um, including the one kind of in our scripture, but when King Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem in 605, he foretold 
the captivity of his own son. So that's pretty crazy. So this brings us to, you know, the diamond in the rough, which is our, our verse, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 through 34, because it's not what we would expect based on what I just shared. These are words of hope amidst words of sorrow. Everything up to this point in the book are words of sorrow. And don't we all need words of hope amidst words of sorrow and doom. So I will read you the scripture now. Here we go. I almost forgot to read it. <laughs> You'll be like, what? Um, 31, 31. Okay, found it. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant within the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with the forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. So that is unusual words coming from the pen of Jeremiah. It's the longest sequence of Old Testament scripture to be requoted again in the New Testament. And it's the only use of the phrase, the new covenant, which came to be known as the New Testament. And I read somewhere this past week that a covenant becomes a testament when um, some, when the, when someone dies, I don't know what that's from, but the word, the testament um, term is inclusive of the fact that the um, prophet or writer of it dies. I don't know if that makes sense or not. So the significance of you and I reading this scripture and studying this scripture today is that we are in Lent. We are in solemnity, a time of prayer, and fasting and preparation. And that's because Holy Week will be upon us soon. And that's where our focus on the horizon is. So today we receive a prophecy of our promise from God to us individually. And as Roxanne said in the beginning of the service, this is when we move intently towards God. So in this time of Lent, if you have not felt like you are moving intently toward God, today's the day. If we're going to talk about the new covenant, then we have to talk a little bit about the old covenant, the first covenant. So what they have in common is that they were both written to people in exile. There's similar words. The first one says, I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. That's from Leviticus. The second we just read says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is evidence that God continues to love his wayward and disobedient people. The new one does not abolish the old one. It fulfills the old one. It supersedes it in which the purpose of the old one can be fulfilled. The first covenant is the covenant of Sinai. The old covenant was solemnized by the blood of sacrificial animals. The new one will be solemnized by the blood of Christ. The old one was written on stone tablets and on scrolls, which were then stored in the Ark of the Covenant. So they were scripted and durable and literal. But the new covenant will be written 
in the hearts of the humans, of actual people, on their very hearts. On my heart and on your heart. And as humans, we've always had a sense of our heart, our, our physical, literal heart. I think that's interesting that in 600 BC, it was the place that connected us to God. Even then, that was sensed by this prophet. We feel our heart beating. We've never seen our own heart. We've seen, I mean, now we've seen hearts, pictures of hearts. We know what it is. We know the science of the heart. But even Jeremiah had an awareness of the God heart connection. So in pondering this, I started to have a memory of a book I read that probably some of you read back in 1991. There was a book called Heart Math. I remember talking about it. So I know that some of you might remember this book. It was written by a man named Doc Childer and I'm sure he's passed away by now, but when I read it, it was new. It was 1991. I was a, a budding scientist in the field of PT, just having graduated. And I was also a budding minister in the church. So I recall it being a really significant idea to me, the hybrid of spirituality and science. Not many books have stuck with me quite that long, just a few, but this one did. And partly because it has you do these exercises in the book. I, I don't have it anymore. I, I would have of course looked it up and, and I did as much sort of looking without, without just buying it again. Um, I remember it has you um, focus very intently on your literal heart, the area in your body that contains your heart for long periods of time to change your physiology. So kind of like meditation, only physiologically um, drawing your attention to your literal heart. And you use this idea to build intuition. And I won't go into the details of the exercises because I'm not going to say them right, but you cut out these little exercises and you put them places in your life where you're going to see them so that when you have stress or when you have the need that you will do these exercises. So I did this and occasionally I will run across one in a place that I don't expect. And that's why the book has stuck with me all this time because, oh, look, there's a little heart math exercise. And although I don't stop and do the exercise, I'm like, oh, I remember that worked. I mean, isn't that funny that it was like, oh yeah, I remember that worked back then. Um, but you know, you kind of, things fade away that we learn. So also I remembered that way back then there was an organization based on these ideas, people that wanted to get together kind of like a book club, but this is 30 years ago um, and talk about and practice and develop the science behind this. And it was called the Heart Math Institute. So they, you know, they wanted to further the ideas of the people, of the author, they believed in it so much, and these sciencey methods of physiologically sensing the heart, and mainly for stress reduction. I remember there was a lot of talk about cortisol. So I've, I've used the concept of cortisol reduction with my patients because it, it is a physiological way of um, helping your body change and lower blood pressure and you know, I work with super stressed out individuals. So um, it's, that part has always kind of been very useful. So as I prepared for this talk, I wondered, oh, wouldn't it be crazy if the HeartMath Institute 31, 30 years ago, what if it still existed? So I Googled it and lo and behold, it still exists and not only exists, but it's thriving in you know, the world of the internet and, and how, the world can become so much smaller with like-minded people who can connect from all over the world. So, oh my gosh, I couldn't stop diving into um, kind of this website and, and where it takes. So I think it's, it's heartmath.org. So those of you who wanna dive deeper um, today can, can look that up. But let me read you the mission and the cause. 
the mission of HeartMath Institute is to help people bring their physical, mental, and emotional systems into balanced alignment with their heart's intuitive guidance. This unfolds the path of becoming heart-empowered individuals who choose the way of love, which they then demonstrate through compassionate care. That's a pretty big mission. The cause, I love this. The cause is to awaken the hearts of humanity. So then that kind of begs the question as opposed to the head, as opposed to whatever else, but the heart has to lead the way, that's their cause. So they, they do these things through science-based physiological self-regulation tools. So I'm basically reading you their stuff from their website. So um, I'm not gonna, you know, like I said, I'm not gonna go into the exercises, but they're similar and more structured to what I do with trauma patients who are in an extreme state of physiological pain and torture. You know, they involve counting, like I said, focusing on that area, um, regulating that region of the body, with the idea that that controls everything. So breath control, visualization, but super specific, not like other, not like a guided meditation. So, and they did a bunch of studies and it's all there in the book. So um, if someone who is in life-threatening pain, pain that can kill you, can change their cortisol levels with some of these tools, then imagine what we can do really quite easily if it's practiced. It's written on our hearts. So think about our scripture. God's promise is written on our hearts and it's been there since you were born and before you were baptized and your whole life. It's always been accessible. We just, I have my own little PowerPoint slides. Is that backwards? Is that word backwards or is it forwards? It's backwards, I mean, it's forwards. Okay, I'm Which not saying I'm looking at <laughs> To me, it's backwards, that's so funny. Okay, weird, all right, well, good. So that's, I told Brian, I don't need you. I'm gonna make my own slides for my part. Um, so in our weakest moments, when we're lost and hopeless, brought to our knees, when we need God the most, it's our decision to connect. So heart math suggests when we connect, we harmonize the resistance between our own mind and heart. And I suggest also this, that it, when we connect, and I'm gonna go through these, once quick and once slow. We know God's love. We know God's joy. We know God's pain. We know God's will. We know God's peace. So by example, I don't always know God's love but I know the love of a mother and a father are an interesting illustration because they're very different. And as a mom, I've had to be very patient as my children connect and disconnect from me. As they grow older, there can be long gaps between when they text me or when I see them, especially at their age now with you know not all of them living in town, really only one of them living in town. And as I go through phases too, I need to give them space to have their agency and live their lives. You know, in my college years, my mom had no idea what I was doing for months on end. And my children don't have that luxury. I know what they're doing a lot, but um, I wait patiently and I'll, I allow them to sort of take the lead in reaching out to me. So last night after a very long, maybe the longest hiatus in communicating with TJ, um, he reached out to me after his soccer game, which was in Nebraska. So I had a very 
that was just text, 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 text. It was like a burst of communication and connecting to me. And it, it, you know, it's overwhelming when it's been a long time. It's, it, it was just so significant. He was telling me how strongly he felt his grandpa at his game in the middle of Nebraska. And he was telling me how long it had been since he felt that peaceful presence. So you can imagine I had the joy of God and the love of God at that moment. This was to me really feeling and understanding what that must be like when we reach out and when we connect to our God in heaven. And also I feel God's joy when I feel my family together, my parents, my siblings, my extended family. It's always a joy that is beyond daily joy that we have, you know, just on our own. It's, it's that feeling of excitement. And sometimes it's, it's expected. We plan to go to the lake together. That is joyful, but sometimes it's unexpected and surprising that we can create and feel joy similar to what God feels when he's so happy for us. Um, and then, although we cannot fully know God's pain, I think it's very important as humans and a necessary part that when we are connected to God, we have God's compassion. And when we are disconnected from the pain of others or refuse it, it can be manifested by justifying or ego or excuses or denial. And when I allow myself to sense the suffering of my coworkers, family, my patients, then I am a better decider of how to help them even though it's easier to be task oriented and to not look at others' pain and suffering. It's easier for me to go through the motions of my day and get through it sometimes. Compassion drives healing. So I must be willing to see God's pain the way that he sees it in the world. Even though it hurts and even though it slows us down. And sometimes it even costs us money to have compassion. We are more at one with God's will. When we align with what's written on our hearts, we align with the covenant that God made to us, his promise to us. And then we know God's will. The final result is that then we can know God's peace. The peace that passes all understanding, that peace that makes no sense, that sailboat that you're on, on a vast ocean in the middle of a violent storm, which some of you are on right now. Reading those words and feeling our hearts beating inside us and knowing that promise is there sometimes is all we have. So this verse today is for you. Individually and specifically, hope isn't on the way, it's here in this promise today. And as you read these words and sense the beating of your heart, you will find it, amen.